of B Talk of this academic calendar year. Today we're delighted to have Alexis Stecker here from the University of Washington, part of the Dove Group down there. And uh, she is going to be doing a presentation for us today on childhood play in the Yukon world, which I'm sure is a, a topic of interest to many. Uh, I'm going to begin first by giving a little detail about Alexis. Um, She's an assistant professor in the human-computer interaction area, in inter human-computer interaction for social good, specifically at the University of Washington Information School. She studies the ways that technologies manipulate and exploit their users and how to design more respectful alternatives, particularly for children. Her past and current work has been supported by Mozilla, Sesame Workshop, Microsoft Research, Facebook, and more. Her scholarship has been covered by the New York Times, Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Good Morning America, and other what? United States media. <laughs> <laughs> she holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from Harvard. And I just found out earlier today that she is also an alum of the LDT, or Learning Design and Technology Program, uh, from Stanford, the farm. And uh, she also has her PhD in Human Centered Design and Engineering. Uh, here is what she's going to talk about today. In the attention economy, every user's time and attention is a valuable commodity with the potential to generate advertising revenue and developers increasingly seek to monetize the attention of young children. Despite this problematic incentive structure, many experts herald children's technology for its potential to bring enjoyable and educational experiences to young people en masse. Who is right? Is technology eroding the best part of childhood or defining it? In this talk, she will present findings from recent studies on designing for children showing what designers should be building and what consumers should be It's very exciting to hear. Please take it away. All right, thank you. I think that was the best intro I've ever had. <laughs> well, hey, let's give the last one. Hey, let's feel welcome. Yeah. Academia doesn't work out. You could try radio. So. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm super happy to be here. Thanks for coming to a talk in the middle of the summer. Um, and really happy to have a chance to talk a little bit about some of our lab's recent work on designing for children, um, specifically for early childhood. So um, as many of you probably know, technology brings tremendous value to young children and their families. They can use it to video chat with friends and family on the other side of the world. Um, children who lack the ability to speak can use a tablet as a synthetic voice. Um, and programs like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood have been shown to foster empathy and pro-social behaviors in young children. We all spend a lot of time with technology. The average adult spends about 10 hours and 39 minutes with a screen each day. Um, and checks their cell phone about 150 times. Um, this isn't just true of adults, it's also true of children who spend more time with technology than they do in school. Um, and in the United States, in low-income families, about 75% of children own their own dedicated device by the time they turn four. Um, so we're very engaged with the technologies that we use, but these are not always empowering experiences. Um, so there is, for example, um, widespread what's known as problematic internet use. Um, this is a pattern of engaging with the internet or internet connected technologies in ways that lead to dysfunction and impairment of daily life. Um, this is not just a first world problem either. And in fact, as national quality of life goes down, the incidence of problematic internet use actually goes up. So uh, for example, in Bangladesh, about 25% of adolescents uh, display symptoms of PIU. People say that they feel compelled to check in with technology even when they think it's going to make them feel lousy or compromise their productivity, um, or even put their physical safety at risk. So I apologize that this is an American statistic, um, but at this very moment, there are 660,000 people, 660, people driving on a road in the United States and looking at a screen. Um, so maybe there are no distracted drivers in Canada, but we have a problem um, with that. So given all of the value that technology offers children, their families, and people at large, um, and some of these challenges, 
learning how to integrate media consumption and manage it um, has become an essential part of daily life. Um, and so the last thing I want to say about this before I talk about some of my own work is that this is very much a designed phenomenon. Um, so many companies have user engagement as an explicitly defined goal for their product. Uh, this is the result of creating experiences that are part of what's known as the attention economy, where your attention and time is a commodity that has value and generates revenue through metrics like ad impressions and click-through rates and page views. Now, companies have multiple ways of attracting and holding your attention or the attention of young children. Um, sometimes they do this by providing you with experiences that offer a lot of value. Um, and sometimes they do this by exploiting classic psychological principles like uh, your responsiveness to variable rewards or your need to belong. So the goal of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is trying to understand how we can support people, um, and specifically young kids, in engaging with technology on their own terms. So using it in ways that offer them value without uh, kind of having all of this baggage come along for the ride. So I want to talk about two um, different studies that we did this past year. Um, first, I just briefly want to talk about a couple of findings um, from a study that looked at how children engage with the experiences that they use today. Um, and then I want to spend a little more time looking at um, a design project that we did to try to understand what we should be building instead. So what kinds of technologies can help kids engage in um, this intentional usage that offers value without uh, bringing along all of these unwanted costs. Okay. Um, so first I want to talk about a project that we called Let's Play, which looked at how children play when they're using uh, tablet apps as compared to traditional toys. So the purpose of this project was to try to understand um, what kinds of apps kids are using right now, what are their favorites, how do they engage with them, and then as a baseline, looking at what their play looks like um, when the stimuli that surround them are toys rather than those types of experiences. So we did an observational lab study we recruited 15 parent-child dyads to come in um, where kids were between the ages of four and six. We had them bring their tablet and we gave them 15 minutes alone in the lab to play with their favorite apps. We also gave them 15 minutes to uh, set the tablet aside and play with traditional, all non-digital toys. Um, and the order in which they engaged in each was counterbalanced across participants. When they played with tablet apps, we had them bring their tablet and play with uh, the games and apps that they use at home. And we also had them bring in their favorite toys, at least the ones that were portable, and spread those around the lab. Um, and since it's easier to bring all of your apps with you than it is to bring all of your toys with you, we also included some kind of non-novel familiar stock toys that we spread around the lab, like art supplies, jigsaw puzzles, um, dolls, and Lego bricks. And then I just want to highlight a couple of findings that came out of this that relate to this topic. Um, so the first was looking at children's responsiveness to their parent and um, how they directed their attention as they played with these materials. So when they were playing with toys, um, we saw that kids and adults engaged in a lot of very precisely uh, co-regulated attention um, and back and forth. So, Things like saying rock, paper, scissors at the exact same time, um, or one, two, three, flip, as they would flip over cards. So this very um, precise attentiveness to each other. As part of that, we saw a lot of dialogue, and we saw that when one of the members of the dyad would make a kind of bid for attention or make a comment, the, uh, the other would pretty much always respond with precision. Um, Sometimes those weren't positive interactions. They spent some time fighting with each other. Uh, but they were very responsive to what their partner said. So for example, um, this is a little snippet where a child was uh, playing with some of our art supplies. She was drawing different hearts on the paper. Her mother was helping her. And sort of out of the blue, she says, when is it Valentine's Day? And looks up from her drawing a little bit. And the parent very promptly says, February. So right now it's July, right? And the child says, yeah, is next month February? Um, and her mom says, no, 
Uh, next month is August, then September, October, November, December, January, February. So it's a ways away. It's like eight months out. The child keeps building on this, and as she's doing this, she's moving back and forth, drawing and then looking up, but always kind of precisely timing her responses with um, her mother's comments. She says, it's like 100. The parent says, 100? She clarifies that she means days. Uh, the parent says, no, more than 100 days. The child says, 1,000? She says, well, not 1,000. It's more like 200 days, more than 200 days away, but less than 300 days. Um, so they're kind of going back and forth, working towards this shared understanding. And the child is playing this whole time. The mom is helping her with the drawing during some of this. Um, and they're kind of engaging in this back and forth while also engaging with the toys and moving in and out of that interaction at their own pace. It was a little <coughs> different with tablets. So here, as parents made bids for children's attention, um, we saw kids dropping a lot of those, ignoring a lot of what their parents said, um, self-interrupting quite frequently. So for example, kids said things like, I'm trying to get it. It's too hard. It's hard because that was the end. Um, or for example, when the parent asks a question about a game that a child's playing, the child responds by saying, um, if I jump, it will fly. If I don't jump, ah, flying fish, as a fish jumps across the screen. Um, and the child sort of redirects their attention on um, command as the app presents this stimulus. And the child never goes back to this conversation with the parent. Um, parents said things like, what is that animal? Can I do this part? Do you want to play something else? Oh, so you can't go off. It was so fun, right? But children never responded to any of these questions. Now, there were some exceptions to kind of this general trend. And we did see that kids would take advantage of natural stopping points, places where the app didn't demand interaction, pauses between levels, places where the child could control the interaction. And at that point, they would respond to their parents. They would draw their parents in. They would show off their accomplishments in the game, and they seemed excited to bring the parent into this, um, into this experience. Um, and then we saw this same pattern where kids were talking to their parents, responding to questions, and bringing parents into the experience when the game was user-paced or when the app was user-paced. So kind of exploratory games where children could move around the world of the app at their own pace. Um, gave them the same kind of freedom that we saw when that little girl was drawing hearts and talking about Valentine's Day. They could kind of bring in the outside world and manage their own attention. Um, so we also looked at kids and parents kind of co-play and mutual engagement with these different experiences. When they were playing with toys, we saw that parents usually found some kind of parallel role or something that they could do at the same time. So um, you know, a child would put together one section of a jigsaw puzzle, and a parent would just spontaneously start working on another section, and they would kind of engage in these um, complementary uh, types of engagement at their own pace. So the parent could build more quickly, and the child could go more slowly, but everybody had a role. We saw parents and kids um, co-engaging around games uh, with this coordinated, precise turn-taking. Um, so again, saying things like one, two, three, flip, and flipping over their cards, or moving back and forth and animatedly arguing about whether or not they really get to move two spaces ahead in Candyland, things like that. Um, and we saw them engage in a lot of kind of collaborative work and problem solving. So the parent would find some job to do that supported the child's activity um, in parallel to the, the child's um, actions. And throughout, we saw that parents were pretty consistently engaged in these play sessions. So they kind of found something to do at their own level, something that was relevant um, and that held their interest. So they would build with Lego bricks, the child would build with Lego bricks, that sort of thing. Um, but again, things were different when kids and parents were playing with tablets. Um, parents, right out of the gate before the session even started, would have made these statements that said they anticipated they were going to be bored. They said things like, oh, I wish I had a magazine or a book as soon as a child brought out a tablet. Um, or while you play, do you mind if I check my email? Um, or, oh, you don't need me for that. Um, and so this is before the play session has even started and sort of suggests that parents didn't expect that there would be a role for them um, in this experience. 
Um, and then in contrast to the, the toy session, for the most part during the tablet session, parents just kind of sat there. Sometimes they would wander away, sometimes they would look over the child's shoulder, um, but they didn't really engage very often. Once again, there were some exceptions to this general theme. So there were some apps that had um, these real world activities that went beyond the screen. So where they would say, um, okay, do this breathing exercise now. And then there kind of became a role for everybody. So you don't have to be the one person looking at the device in order to have something to do. Similarly, there were some apps that had these camera interactions which provided these two natural roles. So someone takes the picture and someone poses for the picture. Um, and kind of put the, ca the, the tablet in this shared space in between the parent and child and gave everybody something to do. Um, and then multi-touch apps were actually a lot more likely to engage the parents. So if there were two different things that you could do on the screen at the same time, and the parent's touches and the child's touches were both supported, um, then sometimes parents got involved and played too. And that was particularly true if the device or uh, if the interface was symmetrical and allowed people to engage from both sides. So here's an example of the child still holding it, but it makes sense for everybody to play and there's sort of a way for the parent to get involved. So the design of the app made a really big difference in terms of whether or not um, the parents engaged in the experience. So there's just a couple of takeaways from this one. Um, First, we saw that children allowed the app to dictate where their attention would go. And it was only when the app kind of um, offered the child the chance to manage their own attention that they did so. Um, and one takeaway from this was especially if uh, you want to create experiences that allow for um, engagement and disengagement and movement between the physical and the digital world, Designing for interruptible apps rather than interruptible users um, is very helpful. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about um, a project to explore how we might design to support intentional technology use. And our goal here was to see if we could support preschoolers in self-regulating their use of media. Um, so engaging with it in the way that they feel good about and owning those choices. We um, ran several studies to try to figure out exactly what we wanted to do. Um, just want to mention two tactical things that came out of our, our first user study where we did di a diary study and interviews with 55 families with preschoolers. A lot of different findings came out of this that influenced what we built, but there are two tactical pieces that I want to mention since they sort of defined what we did. Um, and the first was that parents said, most of the time when kids use technology, they're watching videos. Um, so about 75% of the time when kids use technology of any sort, it was to watch cartoons. Um, and the second was that parents talked a lot about this painful transition point at the end. Um, so they felt pretty good, they were glad that their child had access to technology, but they talked a lot about this battle of turning it off at the end. And that fit really well with our goal of supporting self-regulation. So as a result, we decided to build a video player um, for preschoolers with a careful consideration for that transition point at the end of the experience. Now, there are already a couple of design paradigms that um, are pretty prevalent for how to design the endpoint of a video experience. Um, one is the kind of parental controls model, where at the end of a video, a parent can say, that's going to be it. The child is restricted, and then they are locked out of the experience. Um, and the transition happens because the app forces it to happen. Uh, a very different type of paradigm is what's known as post-play or autoplay. This is a feature in almost every internet video on demand platform. And um, the pattern is just to jump in at that point when the content has ended and automatically start playing something new. So there were some, um, we saw some issues with both of these patterns. Specifically, the parental controls model um, doesn't necessarily support the development of self-regulation. Um, and in fact, self-determination theory would suggest that having those kinds of restrictive structures on children's behavior would undermine their interest in self-regulating. Um, and then the 
post play or auto play model also seemed uh, challenging from a self regulation perspective. If anyone has ever binge watched Netflix, maybe that's familiar. Or maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, so instead, we looked to models of how children develop self regulation in non digital contexts. So specifically, we drew from two evidence based curricula for preschoolers um, with a lot of years of evidence behind them. Um, that use what's known as the plan, do, review cycle um, to support children in thinking intentionally about what it is they want to do, um, giving them information as they do it about their behavior as compared to their plan, and then giving them um, support at the end for reflecting on those choices um, and sticking with their plan. The result of all of this was an app that we called Coco's Videos. It allows children to construct um, their own playlist of videos and, um, and watch them sequentially. It's kind of a wrapper around YouTube. Um, so they choose a time limit with their parents as kind of a ceiling on how long the collection of videos can take. And then they pick out what they're going to do when this experience ends. Um, so what will they do when all of their videos are over? They then have a few different mechanisms for selecting from um, all of the content that's available on YouTube. And they can press play to start the experience. So it plays each video in order at the start of the last video and then again one minute before the entire experience ends. Um, it puts up these warnings that tell them, hey, this transition um, is coming up. These are very in your face. So it pauses the video. You have to touch it in order to get it go away so you kind of can't miss that it happens. And then at the end, it reflects back to the child what it is they said they were going to do next. Um, and this character, Coco, asks them, um, you know, now it's time to read. Are you ready to read? Um, and then importantly, there's this uh, home button that allows them to go back if they want to and watch more videos. And the reason that we built that in there was so that children really would be making a choice. Um, and they have some scaffolding, but they're still engaging in this act of self-regulation. Um, so they are still choosing to stick with their plan <coughs> or not. So we created three different versions of this transition screen experience. The first is exactly identical. It reflects that activity back to them. Coco says, now it's time to read. Are you ready to read? But it also then begins auto-playing additional content. In the third version, um, everything is the same. Coco comes on, says, now it's time to read. Are you ready to read? But there is no home button. So the child is locked into this experience, kind of parental control style, or uh, is locked into this plan. Can we call these? Um, our neutral, post-play, and controlled versions of the app. So we ran a deployment study. We recruited 24 families with preschoolers um, to take this app home. And they had it for three weeks. They saw each of these three conditions um, for one week with the order counterbalanced across families. Um, and then at the end, we had parents fill out a survey about what had happened. Additionally, um, as they use the app, we also collected two kinds of data from the app itself. We logged data about what they did from the device, and then we also used the um, microphone to capture audio data, about three minutes of data, around that transition point. So we could kind of listen in and hear what happened when the experience ended. My husband would sometimes be like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm listening to audio clips of kids having tantrums. <laughs> So what did we find? Um, well, I want to mention just a few of the themes. You should go read the paper if you want more. I couldn't fit it all in. Um, one of the things that we saw that I was really excited about was that kids showed quite a bit of autonomy um, when they were dealing with Coco at the end. So Coco says, now it's time to eat. Are you ready to eat? Kid says, it's time to eat, and I'm eating. Now it's time to play outside. Are you ready to play? The child says, I'm ready to go outside. I clicked going outside after my videos. So sort of owning this experience and reflecting their own plan. Um, back to the listener. There's one where the child says, now I'm not going to watch anymore. I'm going to do something else. Um, there was a choice where you could press something else. 
Um, and mom says, okay, what are you gonna do? And the child says, now nah, I'm going to dance. Turn on the music. Kind of owning the experience again. We also saw kids do a lot of what's known as other regulation. If you don't know that this is a thing and you have children, it might make you feel better to know that this is an important part of learning to self-regulate. So for example, Coco says, now it's time to read. Are you ready to read? The child says, dad, it's time to read. See what the tablet said? He's sort of telling his dad to go read a book. Coco says, now it's time for bed. Are you ready to sleep? And the child says, everybody, it's time for bed. Tries to send the whole family off to bed. Coco says, now it's time to eat. Are you ready to eat? The child turns to his brother and says, it's time to eat. Are you ready to eat? Um, and so, like I said, this was interesting to us because other regulation is a known part of developing self-regulation um, and is part of the process of internalizing some of these norms. And we also saw that kids started to ritualize this transition experience a little bit. Um, so Coco says things like, you know, it's time for bed, are you ready to sleep? Um, and, or I'm sorry, Coco is about to say this. So the playlist ends and the child's with her mother and um, she quotes this audio before Coco actually says it out loud and says, I want to hear her say it's time for bed. Um, in another instance, Coco says it's time to eat, asks if the child's ready to eat. The child says that she is. Then her mother says, we're not actually going to eat just yet. We're going to wait for everybody else to come home. And the child says, well, that's OK. But then I want to hear Coco say it's time to eat again when it's really time to eat. Um, and so we found this kind of interesting because it sort of suggests that this transition experience started to become meaningful for the child. We looked at children's behavior across the three different conditions that I mentioned. Um, when post-play or autoplay was turned on, um, kids were significantly less likely to answer Coco's question out loud, so to talk back to Coco. Um, they were less likely to make those autonomous statements where they sort of described their ownership um, of the plan. They spent significantly more time um, using the tablet after the playlist ended, and uh, the, it was much more likely that a parent had to intervene and actually turn it off. Um, and that also included a lot of uh, friction between parent and child. We asked parents what they thought about these different versions. Um, we asked them how they felt about the controlled version where the child was locked out as compared to this neutral one where they had the option to restart. Um, and a majority, or yeah, a majority of parents said that they preferred having these controls lock the child um, into letting go of the tablet. But there were still um, a number of parents who said they didn't prefer it, and even the ones who said they liked it talked a lot about how um, this kind of rigid design didn't give them the flexibility to revisit their plan or kind of um, make changes to what they thought would be best um, for the whole family at that time. So a lot of parents said that maybe on net they liked it, but still felt it didn't totally fit their daily life. Nobody preferred post-play. Um, although there were a few parents who said that they didn't really mind it. Either. So a few take takeaways from this. Um, first, we saw that when the device, um, or I'm sorry, when the, when the experience tried to support children's autonomy, they kind of lived up to that. Um, and they did demonstrate this um, and interest in self-regulating their use. We saw this need to create experiences that support flexible limits and revision. So kind of moving beyond the traditional model of parental controls where families are expected to have a clear understanding of exactly what they want their child to do, um, a hard and fast plan, and then this sense of valuing sticking with your limits, the limits that you've set. And then finally we saw that autoplay really did not serve children well. Um, and so one of the big conclusions for me from all of this was that if we want to decrease children's excessive use of media, parental controls might not be the answer. A better approach might be to stop designing experiences to encourage excessive use. So um, looking at all of this together, there are a few things that came out of this for my lab that will move our work forward. Um, the first is the sense that children want to manage their own attention. So when kids are playing with tablets, certainly we saw that they really liked those experiences. They like playing gaps and games. 
but when they had the option to play games and interact with a parent and direct their attention in and out of the experience, they did so. Um, and so I think that's something that designers really can foster and support. Second, I am also convinced that children want to self-regulate their media use rather than being sucked into continuously engaging with these experiences um, on the app's terms. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of cultural narratives and kind of content in the air about how kids are addicted to videos or want to watch videos forever. And we didn't really see that. We saw that when kids had support um, for making their own choices, they did so. Um, and then finally, I just want to close by talking about um, why I think it's so interesting and important to study the design of technology for early childhood. And to do that, I want to um, share a story about some research that I had absolutely nothing to do with. Um, so about 60 years ago in Ypsilanti, Michigan, a group of researchers conducted an experiment where they randomly assigned a few hundred three-year-olds to one of two different preschool types of preschool classrooms. And the first type was this kind of um, direct instruction, typical preschool environment of the day. And the second was a research-based preschool experience that was intentionally designed to support children in identifying what matters to them, um, becoming autonomous, child choice, and warm, supportive relationships with caregivers. So the researchers' uh, hypothesis was confirmed, and the children in the experimental classrooms did better in kindergarten two years later. But there was actually a lot more going on, and those same children also did better in high school and were more likely to graduate. Those three-year-olds are now senior citizens, and in the intervening 60-something years, the three-year-olds who were in the experimental classrooms were more likely to go to college, less likely to be incarcerated, more likely to delay having children, uh, more likely to vote, more likely to volunteer in their communities, and really the whole course of their life shifted, uh, at least in part, based on what happened when they were three. So I think the moral of this story is that if you want to change the world, it is a two-step process. And step one is to thoughtfully create supportive experiences for preschoolers that help them be their best selves. And then step two is to wait 30 years or so. <laughs> and I think that's really exciting because today's three-year-olds spend a lot of time with digital media, which gives all of us this way of reaching right into their daily life and crafting what those experiences are like. And so I think it gives you a great opportunity for making this future world a much better one. Thank you. And now we have time for questions. <laughs> Anyone? Is Coco's Studio available for use? You know, it's an open alpha on the Google Play Store, so you could find it. It's sort of, you know, flying under the radar, but it's there. You could try it out. Yeah. Um, so as a parent of a 10 and a 13-year-old yeah. struggling, we, we used to call them the post-video meltdowns, that yeah. this 10-minute period of time after the video stopped, that we just had to kind of walk away. And after about 10 minutes, things always got a little better. Um, but so what do you recommend for teens, pre-teens, <laughs> oh, and no. what do you recommend for adults? Yeah. And yeah. it's obviously more than just videos, right? So Coco looks great for the video playing piece, but then there's all the addictive games and social media. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so many of my recommendations are really for designers rather than people. I have a PhD student working with me who's much more optimistic. So right now he's doing a study to understand how people, he calls it architect their own environment. So looking at things like setting your phone to grayscale or leaving it in the kitchen at night when you go up to bed so you don't hear it. 
see what works for adults and then try to recommend strategies for people. Um, so I think that's all really exciting too. I think all of the things that I talk about with three-year-olds, including like video meltdowns, I think apply to all of us, really. You know, and as I talk to parents, a lot of them say things like, well, I just feel like a hypocrite. I mean, I can't tell my three-year-old not to watch this when I'm watching all these videos too. Um, and so, again, I think a lot of that is by design. I think all of these experiences are designed to capture and hold our attention. Um, people talk, come back to the same things. All of my interview participants talk about social media and casual games and how um, they kind of habitually use all of these things um, and don't feel great about it and don't find them meaningful but keep doing it anyway. Um, so I don't know. I don't have great answers for you other than design better technologies. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know what are the uh, other socioeconomic factors that uh, fit into this scene of children using technology or over in the technology. I've seen many of my friends um, start having kids um, don't want to give lots of screen time to their children because they're educated. And I see the patterns of more educated friends that tend to not prefer or not prefer to give screen time to children. But when it comes to a high income family, I noticed that they have they can afford many toys. And toys are expensive, and kids are get bored with toys really quick. Yeah. So they need to switch it quick, but for the lower income family, actually, eventually, buying a tablet is a more affordable um, approach. Yeah. And, something to fun. and also, a lower income family cannot hire a babysitter, too. So to, so they're to, do, do, doing a trade-off between being themselves, like parents being themselves, like they're having their own life, between being a good parent. Um, so tablet is mediating that negotiation process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's so much there. Um, like race and class and living situation really complicates all of this. You know, invariably when I give talks on this topic, someone says like, why don't we just have people pay for everything and then we don't have to have this attention and economy problem. Um, or maybe some things can be paid, but then of course, Rich people are the only ones who reap the benefits, right? Um, or we'll talk. We'll use the term electronic babysitter very pejoratively, but um, in a lot of our studies, we found that this option really offers a lot of very real value to parents. So being able to give children um, an experience that will keep them independently occupied um, is so valuable for parents, and I, I don't think that's something that we should ignore. And you know, as families um, have more stress. Um, and more of those challenging factors in their day-to-day -day life, that becomes even more and more of a valuable option. So, yes, I totally agree with all of that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just following up on Joanna's comments about teenagers. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> the plus one is there. Uh, but, but is it really, is, I wanted you to go a little farther into that. Is it as simple, I feel like as an the adult version of having separation and difficulties with that it really would be profoundly helpful if I could, at the start of the session, say, I'm going to do this for 30 minutes, and then wake me up out of my trance. Yeah. Turn it off and say, you're done now, right? That's and right. Really we talk so about this internet blackout sometimes. Would, that simple thing that we did with those videos would actually help a lot. In yeah. Terms of, of, instead of just doing the auto play. So that's a perfect so is, it as simple, is it as simple as that? Do we need to design applications for teenagers, for adults, or whatever, that just let people yeah, so I mean, like goal setting theory and all of that really aligns with everything that we did here for three year olds. I think autoplay has a similar effect on people of all ages. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You can't eat just one or whatever. Um, and that's a really nice setup. I did a study with adults where we built a system level intervention for their Android device that had them set some goals, um, gave them reminders, said, oh, you finished the five minutes you said you wanted on Facebook um, and what have you. And we did um, another baseline and intervention uh, within subjects comparison. And after they used our intervention, or when they used our intervention, they cut back on the time they spent with um, experiences they said they don't feel good about 
where they don't feel good about their habits by about 21%. And their um, rate of engagement with the experiences they did feel good about stayed the same. Um, so kind of helping them engage and cutting back in this targeted way. So that was really exciting. Um, at the same time, our intervention was only a week. I don't know what would happen over the long term. Um, and I think it really has to be built into the app itself. But I love the idea of having this uh, concept of like, portion size and knowing what it is you want and consuming content at that rate as opposed to just having a bottomless feed of infinite content because I'm not exactly sure you know what the right number of Facebook stories is what you want to see but I know it's not infinity mm -hmm. so there should be some kind of container I think yeah Exactly. <coughs> The more definition and the more kind of structure there is around this thing that's intentionally unstructured and amorphous and indefinite, I think it really helps. Yeah. So I have a question regarding controlling the amount of attention. So it was a good example of playing with toy and the conversation could continue versus the one that the kid was playing with an app. And so there was a lot of interruption. So I was thinking that maybe we can control on the amount of the like the inf visual information density or to or manage the immersiveness of the game to control the attention to the surrounding environment, let's say. Yeah, I like that a lot. I, we didn't really look at visual density. In fact, we didn't have like a great um, screen capture. I wish we had captured it from the device itself. Um, but I think that would be a very interesting angle to look at. What we definitely did see was um, the kind of interaction demands, so stimulating stuff flinging itself around, motion and that kind of thing, um, just captured and directed the child's attention. Um, but it may just be that you know, what's presented visually, whether or not it's animated, also makes a difference. I think that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. My question is actually related to this one. Yeah. Uh, because um, for my little babysitting experience, I noticed that when the kid, um, she was now, but um, when it was, there was less visual excitement, less, uh, less rapidity in, in the images and less content, the post video capturing was tended to be shorter. Yeah, that's interesting. But this is, this is just not with one kid. So yeah. I can't really generalize. But I was wondering if you could use um, the information that you get, the data that you gather from these different Tesla. Yeah, that's and interesting. See if you can connect that. I, I was also wondering from the questions that uh, uh, other people asked if, um, because you mentioned someone after how at three years old and then 30 years later, is self regulation, is it something where, okay, you learn it, it's, it's like you learn it um, at three, is it, is it really going to stay with you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is a very naive question. <laughs> no, that's a very good question. And it's just like, it's no matter how hard, and I was cynical now, but I feel like these kids who are learning to self regulate will still be struggling more and more as technology has become so omnipresent in our lives. Yeah, for sure. I mean, both are definitely true. Like, there are individual differences in self-regulation. But then our ability to self-regulate is very much context-dependent as well. Um, and if technology continues to be designed 
with this end goal in mind of making you pay attention to it for as long as possible, it will probably be at least somewhat successful. So, um, yeah. Okay, I'm really this, but can it be, do you think we can determine a, a way of tracking whether these kind of exercises over the years have helped certain individuals become better at self-regulating? I mean, I hope so. So if you know someone who wants to give me a grant for a longitudinal study, <laughs> I will come back in 30 years and let you know. Yeah, no, I think that's very important. But it's also very messy, you know, very, um, just so much noise around all of this, but I think very important to try to understand that. But it does seem clear to me that if designers create this experiences, experience with that goal in mind, they will get their way. Yeah. Uh, uh, for your first study, you were looking at the observational studies of like how people are playing and seeing the difference in interaction. Like, uh, there was like 15 people, right? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things I'm curious about is to what extent are you, you suspect like different populations would really change those dynamics? Oh yeah. Like, I have, totally. I have really fond memories of when I was like a young Warp Snapper playing Legend of Zelda with my dad and like yeah. the parts where it's like, oh, this puzzle, I don't know what it's doing, and then he'll drop in and solve it, and then we might go through a boss together or something like that. And, like doing a lot of that iterative turn-taking and trying to solve things yeah. for it. But I mean, it wasn't designed for that sort of iteration, really. But that's just how we did work. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older and just stopped playing video games as much, then that stuff stopped happening as much. Yeah. So it's like one of those things where it's like, maybe like if people are actually engaged in the video games that kids are playing, that might change that sort of dynamics. Definitely. No, I mean, it's a small qualitative study, I think lots of different aspects of people's parenting practices would really reshape what happens. Even within this small study, we saw kind of these distinctive signatures to parent-child play um, across the two form factors, but within the dyad. So, you know, the way the parent and the child talked to each other, you know, was the parent really um, authoritarian and barking orders at the child? That happened in both. And so we saw these distinctive um, signatures her family, um, and really just spent the time kind of looking at what themes cut across as well. Um, and then also, I feel like it would totally be possible for different form factors to produce different results. So um, there, it's certainly possible that other types of um, screens or orientations or sizes or consoles or multiplayer support or whatever could make a really big difference. Um, what we found with the tablets, and I didn't talk about this here, but we saw that kind of the form factor and the experience was designed in a way that really precluded shared experiences. So it, the kids kind of hunched over them. A lot of times parents would try and like get into that space and it was just physically very difficult. Um, and then at the same time, we consistently saw that when they were playing with toys, almost no matter what they played with, they created this shared space that was about the same size right in between them. So they would take the bin of Legos and dump it out and spread it around. Or they would take the art supplies and spread them out and each sit on one side or the other. Or they would take the dollhouse and put it right in between them. And when the tablet app allowed for that, they did it. So when they're playing tic-tac-toe and it's symmetrical and you can touch it from either side, they set it on the floor in between them. But most games didn't allow for that. Uh, I was wondering, like, why did like why did you decide to include a digital character in the design? And like, over time, did children start to grow hatred of that character because it only pops up and it's telling the children to do, go do something else, right? <laughs> so over time, they might start to hate the character. Yeah, you know what? Like, this app and a couple others, it just made me wonder if I'm like setting the bar too high because kids seem to just like anything, like. They seem to love Coco, and it didn't do anything, right? It just comes up at the end, it doesn't move, it says this one thing, and we hear them on the audio talking about their friend Coco, or how cute she is, or Daddy, come look at the bear, and that kind of thing. So honestly, they seemed a little attached to it, which I didn't really expect. Um, and we only put a character in there because we wanted to phrase it as a question, and we thought that maybe this would be a more natural way to present a question-based interface, but there did seem to be these hints of a parasocial relationship there that I did not expect at all. Yeah. Yeah. My question is about uh, authority delegation. So mm -hmm. you were, you were um, 
showing Coco um, displaying a notification to the kids when uh, the activity was about to end. So for me, that's kind of uh, delegating the authority to a system to tell the kid that something is happening, which is something I do uh, with my with my kid nowadays myself. So do you think that could have long-term effects with kids that are uh, older than three to five? Because in my opinion, three to five is a very malleable age <laughs> for kids to say, okay, you're not doing this anymore, and they will drop a tantrum, but they like will what put a something year in front of them, and that's okay. it. But yeah. my experience with an older kid yeah. is that he just plans to say no. <laughs> so I, I, I would like to know in the future what would be the effect of that uh, authority delegation. Yeah, that's a great question. And part of the reason we did it was because in our interview study, um, so many parents talked about these kind of ad hoc strategies they had for um, using something else as a scapegoat. So telling their kids like, oh, Wi-Fi just doesn't work here, even when it totally does. Um, or like, oh, in New York, they don't have any garbage truck videos on YouTube. Sorry, I don't know. Um, and kind of making something else the scapegoat. And parents have told us that like it's harder to have a power struggle with an iPad than it is with a parent. Um, and that kids would kind of perceive parents' demands as this threat to their autonomy in a way that they didn't, um, didn't see when kind of like a timer or this neutral third party mediator says time's up. Um, so that was one of the reasons we went that route. But it also lines up with what these preschool curricula do when they have children plan out their activities. Um, and so to the extent that it lines up with what we know about behavior change and self-regulation um, across the developmental continuum, I do think that um, kids of all ages can be supported in their autonomy and their self-regulation by making some kind of commitment up front and then being reminded of it later. But that might look different and it might be less authoritative when you present it to a teenager. So maybe instead it asks like, is this still what you want to do? Um, and just kind of provides this natural stopping point and moment of reflection. But I don't know. Next study. Okay, the clock on the wall is telling me that it's now time to stop. And I have no autonomy to tell it that, that we have to stop. I'm so sorry. So, uh, so with that in mind, Let's thank our guest speaker for I know there were several people who still wanted to ask questions, and there may be an opportunity because yes, Alexis's be flight doesn't leave for a little while yet. <laughs> but I want to make sure that people who need to go places and get to things, and we have people who are in class and whatever, get to the things that they need to get to. But thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you in yeah, yeah. September. The other class today as well. Yeah. Oh, the showcase! There's the showcase! Don't forget about the showcase. Come to the showcase. It's next week. It's not a lecture, but it's the showcase. And there'll be posters and demos and exciting things, so make sure you come. And there'll be food. We'll see you next week.